am the kid moving ninja. Hi, Internet! And welcome to Kid Movie Ninja with your hosts, Fighting Leaf and Husky the Wolf. Ever like a movie but you don't really know why? A movie that, by all accounts, should elicit more of a meh than anything? A lot of times, movies are good for really specific reasons. They tackle interesting subjects, or they have really great presentation, the characters are freaking hilarious! Then there are those rare films whose merits are a little bit harder to pin down. You like them, but you don't know why you should. You just do. Well folks, today we got just that! Indeed. Time for a long overdue episode of Gotta Review Em All, with the very last movie that I own that we haven't talked about yet, Jirachi Wishmaker. We get an intro to what Pokemon are again, and about an evil organization that plans to use one in particular, Groudon, to do evil stuff! One man stumbles upon an ancient artifact that could grant him the power to control this beast, but we all know who's gonna end up stopping him. Enter Ash Ketchum, a boy from Pallet Town, but this story isn't really about him, but about his traveling companion Max, May's little brother. That's the very first thing this movie does very right, but we'll get to that when we get to it. The funny thing about wishes? Sometimes they really do come true. And that is why you must be especially careful for what you wish. Because you just might get it. I want you all to remember that. It's gonna be important later. Meet the gang. Ash, Brock, May, and Max. They're off looking for the Millennium Comet. So, where's the Millennium Comet anyway? It won't appear for another 23 hours and 42 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Spock. When they get to where they're going, however, there is nothing! Say, remember how all those other Pokemon movies had these visually interesting opening credit sequences? Sure? Except for the seventh movie, which someone reviewed out of order. Look, I'm sorry, alright? Unforgiven! Well, this movie got one too, but it ain't a battle or a race this time! Time for a little experiment. This is one way I could describe this scene. So yeah, instead of something exciting, like watching Pokemon show off their power in fantastical ways, we see... construction. whoop de doo Can we get to something interesting, please? Or he could describe it like this. We see the slow approach of the caravan from the distance, and when they arrive, something fascinating happens. Little by little, we see a world of darkness fill more and more with color and energy until the pieces come together to create the Millennium Fair, a celebration of the arrival of the Millennium Comet, a heavenly body that is visible from Earth for one week every thousand years. See, a lot of this critic stuff boils down to what attitude you bring to the table. What do we really think? Pick one. Okay, that is just flat out witchcraft right there. This is the Great Butler, a skilled magician who is more than meets the eye. Transformers joke. Ha! Ah! This whole construction scene can be compared to a concept that nostalgia critic dubbed Stuff in his Waterworld review. It's meant to be a spectacle as you see moving parts come together to form a unified whole. Anyway, the fair kicks off and Ash and the gang see the Great Butler's act. And Curlia here sounds like it's voiced by a dude. He threw a tarp, dude! Calm down! Just add fire and Curlia evolved into the lovely assistant. I was a lovely assistant once! It was awful. This is Diane, Butler's assistant, and with her she has one large crystal. And I just realized that they never explain why she's carrying that thing on stage. Hey, you're right! Plot hole! Plot hole! Plot! I don't care. Wishmaker. The comet. Oh? I wish you were here. With me. You are. That can only result in good. So Max hears the rock talking to him some more and runs on stage. Normally, this would result in an embarrassment moment. That's the obvious route for this to go. The cast would get mad and Max would be humiliated. I hate scenes like this, mostly because I don't handle secondhand embarrassment well. Imagine our relief when something entirely different happens. 
No joke, I actually stopped playing this movie the first time I saw this because the trope bugs me that much. And I thought I could smell it coming a mile away. But that's not what happens here. Instead of having the awkward pause of indignant awkwardness, the great butler makes them part of the show, rolling with the situations like a real pro. Then blows them up with hyperbeam. Uh, whoops. Which is exactly how we lost Professor Cabbage. I'm not dead yet. He will be missed. Probably. I just need an ambulance. As you've probably guessed, it's all just a trick and Ash and Max are fine. Unlike poor Cabbage. I can see my spleen! Also, I just love how they introduce themselves to the crowd. My name is Ash. I'm Max the Great. Oh, that little punk. Right as they're taking their bows, however, who should finally arrive but Team Rocket actually doing Team Rocket type things? You mean they're actually contributing to the plot? Well, this part anyway. I'll take it! It's been so long since they've mattered! The rest of the scene plays out like an episode of the TV show. Team Rocket tries to make off with Pikachu, but they're defeated with gimmicks and thunderbolts. It's just a great old time before they go blasted off again! Bye! Now we're gonna take a look at that choice this movie made that was really good. Putting Max in the limelight instead of Ash. See, Ash Ketchum is the main character of the TV show and of most of the movies. But this time around, the magical MacGuffin chose someone else to plot bond with. And that is Max. It gives Ash, and frankly the audience, a break from having the whole plot revolve around the same guy over and over. I'll explain more why Max is the right choice later. Anyway, time for exposition! Turns out that a wish-granting magical Pokémon called Jirachi is living inside of that rock! Why do all these Pokémon movies revolve around rocks? There were the three treasures in the second movie, the meteorite in the seventh movie, that soul do in Pokémon Heroes, and I'm sure that future movies will have other rocks in them. Get back on track, Husky. Jirachi is a Pokémon said to grant wishes. Remember that and only wakes up for one week every thousand years when the Millennium Comet is visible. In order for him to do anything though, the Comet's gotta be out and he's gotta have a buddy. And that buddy is Max! Max, can I see what it feels like? Uh, huh? Let me see! I thought it's crazy to be friends with a rock! Uh, I can see why a lot of the fan base doesn't like Max that much. Personally, I don't see anything he does in this movie to be intolerable. He's a kid and he's got a kid's temperament. Anyway, the comet comes over the night sky and the crystal starts to turn into a screensaver. Then it tears into a floating space baby! The great butler learns of Jirachi's awakening and... I'm starting to get the impression that he's gonna be the bad guy in this picture. Well, these guys have a little wish-granting super infant, so what's the first thing they do? I would have wished for bacon myself, but candy's a close second. As it turns out though, Jirachi was only teleporting already existing candy from elsewhere to where they were. Getting completely carried away in the process and causing significant problems. Making him a dirty little thief who deserves 41 lethal injections and 10 life sentences! Well, Oscar Wilde once said the only thing worse than not getting what you want is getting it. Anyway, when May tells Jirachi to get rid of the problem... Jirachi, get rid of the problem! Get rid huh? of problem? Okay. So he gets rid of the problem. He then falls asleep just to avoid responsibility, just like a real baby or sitcom husband. The next day, Ash, Brock, and May help out around the park, while Max and Jirachi run around being goofy. Much like Team Rocket! They don't matter anymore in this movie. LAME! Also... They can't catch me! What are you doing? <laughs> you can't catch me! Jirachi doesn't have a helpful bone in his body. Anyway, there was another selling point to this movie, and that was the appearance of the Pokémon Absol, here to pretty much be mysterious and whatnot. Jirachi explains that Absol is here for him, and then teleports the Pokémon protecting him several hundred feet in the air. I don't... I do not know, okay? 
But he's no match for the great butler who shows off his skills and tactics by... Wait! I might not be a Pokedork, but I know that Absol's a dark type Pokemon, and they are not affected by psychic attacks like Actually, hypnosis. Non-damaging moves like hypnosis do have No one asked you! <laughs> <laughs> then Jirachi falls asleep again before he can say anything useful. Because why wouldn't he? Butler takes Jirachi away while everyone is sleeping and hooks him up to his crazy science stuff! Diane doesn't like what Butler is doing, and Butler responds with a flashback. Apparently he was a scientist attempting to resurrect the legendary Pokemon of land by the name of Groudon for a group called Team Magma. But his machinery didn't have the power necessary to accomplish this. Humiliated, Butler was then kicked out of Team Magma and swore vengeance for their betrayal. Back to reality, he attempts to force open Jirachi's third eye so that he can absorb the power of the Millennium Comet. Because Jirachi has one of those, and that's what it do. Um, does anyone else get really creepy vibes from this combination of sights and sounds, or is it just me? Nope, there's no weird or inappropriate symbolism going on here. That's messed up. Most of that's on you guys! Shut your noise hole! So that happens, stuff explodes, and the rest of the gang shows up to rescue Jirachi. It's not too late to stop. Why would I stop now that I've gotten so close? Just have faith in me, Diane. I'm doing it for you! For her, this has nothing to do with Diane. It's not for me. I've never wanted this. Diane! Good crap, he's like that guy who buys someone a birthday present just so he can use it himself. All right, let's see what we got. Um, we have a tube of needle wax, huh? Yep, only the good stuff. And the complete collection of Sonic Underground? A classic no household should be without. Is this Rainbow Dash underwear? Yeah, yeah, don't don't wear those for a while, okay? They do the logical thing and get Jirachi away from Butler, and even Absol manages to escape. Now it's just a matter of getting Jirachi back where he belongs. A place called Farina, a magical faraway place where the sun is always shining and the air smells like warm room. Seriously, two reviews in a row? I like that joke, leave me alone. Anyway, they go back on their long trip to Farina to set things right. So Diane explains to the gang what was already explained to the audience. Groudon? Isn't that the legendary Pokemon rumored to have incredible powers? Is it even possible to be any more vague than that? Yeah. But yeah, Butler wants to use the comet's power to fuel his science things to make a Groudon. Butler Wait. If Jirachi can grant wishes, why can't he just wish for a Groudon? What was that said at the beginning of this movie? And that is why you must be especially careful for what you wish. Because you just might get it. There seems to be relatively little talk about actual wishing in a movie about a being that supposedly grants wishes. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention the nauseating shaky cam of this scene. I am seriously getting sick. And it's so bad in the next scene that even the characters are passing around. After that, this movie goes out of its way to fail the Bechdel test. Look it up. Apparently, Butler wasn't always a crazy person, and there might be a chance to get his old self back. Triumphant music! Travel montage away! Hey, wait. I just realized something. What's that? They're driving for several days, right? Yeah. Over wilderness and road without a paved road in sight. Why are they getting gas for that thing? Uh, don't think, Husky. Just watch. Time goes on and there's only two nights left of the comet, after which Jirachi will go back into hibernation for another thousand years. This upsets Max, since he and Jirachi have actually gotten really close in this time. Here's part of the reason we think Max was the right choice to make for the plot's central character for Jirachi to bond with. First of all, we know Max is often a bratty little snot face, but as a kid who's gonna lose his good friend very soon and can't do anything about it, 
That's something most kids aren't prepared to deal with, and it makes for a tough bit of reality that Max has to face, just like we all do. Secondly, this particular scene gives Ash a chance to share some wisdom that he's legitimately earned throughout the series. A good friend left me, and I miss her every day. But I... I know we'll always be friends forever. They got you. That friend he's referring to is obviously Misty, his very first traveling companion. They parted ways by this point in the series, so Ash really knows what he's talking about here. It's brief, but it's a meaningful callback to the show's past. During this point, the series would show flashback episodes where Ash would describe, you know, adventures that he's had in the past. Some would call that lazy filmmaking, but it's not! These callbacks to the show's past help introduce younger viewers to adventures they might have missed out on, and shown us that Pokemon has had a long, rich history. Acknowledging that history is a good thing, and shows our main character has grown over time. They arrive at Farina, which looks like wherever they were trying to get to and up. When they camp out, Mei sings this lullaby that her mother used to sing for Max. This isn't the first time she sang it, but it really helps give the movie a kind of more personal tone. It's nice. I like it. Da -da! Absol arrives again and leads them to the cave where they first found the crystal holding Jirachi. Once they get to the right spot, Max doesn't want to let Jirachi go. I don't know if you can really grant wishes, but if you can, then I have a big one for you right now. I wish you didn't have to go so we can stay together forever. Not gonna lie, this scene and that line always give me the feels. Jirachi is about to absorb energy from the comet the natural way, slowly giving it to the Earth over 1,000 years. But then Butler arrives and traps Jirachi in more evil science stuff! That monster! Shut up! You're mad. Not mad. Just a little angry and maybe a wee bit impatient to get on with the show. After hearing that line, I started really asking myself why it was I was enjoying this movie so much. If looked at objectively, it is super tropey. How is it that it's managing to hold my attention like it is? I think I have an answer for that, but I'll save that for the end. Meanwhile, Butler tries to cage our heroes in some kind of weird force field type thing, but the wild Pokemon in the area, led by Absol, break the generators and set him free. Stuff happens and Butler is now draining the power from the comet to draw a really creepy picture on the ground. Ash and Max hop on the back of a Flygon to stop their operation, but Butler has an ace up his sleeve in the form of a Salamence. In spite of this, however, Max and Pikachu manage to free Jirachi, but it's too late. Groudon is reborn! Wait, that, that ain't no Groudon. Nope. It's, uh... Tentacle spewing life leech pulling everything and anything with a pulse into it to rob it of its energy. Uh, can we wrap this up now? Indeed, we can. The tentacle spewing. Don't call it that! Fine. Not Groudon whips its nasty tentacles all over the place, snatching up everything and everyone. We get more magical magician puns. Team Rocket exists. It takes Diane away from Butler, opening his eyes to how cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs he's been. Brock and May are scooped up next. The remaining cast are saved via Jirachi teleportation. Twice, three times, I forget. Flag on his back and landing a helping wing. Butler's plan is to literally reverse the polarity on his machine with Jirachi's help. At least it's not multimodal reflection sorting. They don't trust Butler at first, but Jirachi says to do it. Ash and Co set up a distraction while Butler sets up his stuff, the ground is really unstable. Not Groudon sounds like an elephant. Things keep going wrong until Ash flips this fitch. Butler makes a heroic sacrifice. Things get really icky, but after some slightly creepy imagery, Jirachi blasts the thing away and puts everyone back on the ground via teleportation. It's time for Jirachi's hibernation, and everyone joins in one last rendition of the lullaby. Butler isn't evil anymore. The day is saved, and the movie ends on a Chucky quote. Objectively speaking, this movie is nothing special. Its flaws are many, but I forgive them all and enjoy the ride anyway. So why is that? This is kind of the reverse situation of The Seventh Brother, in that while it has plenty of cons, the pros outweigh them. Making Max the main focus instead of Ash was a great choice, because his childish nature made him the perfect playmate for the childish Jirachi. 
It was also really nice to see Team Rocket get a little action for once, even if it amounted to nothing. Most of all, it was the movie's focus on the personal aspect rather than on the action that made it feel, well, personal. The stakes were just as much about protecting their friends as much as it was saving the world from a madman. Or maybe I'm just reading too much into it. I like the movie whether I have any really good reasons for it or not, and whether or not it was really even that good. Not really much of a review then, is it? We shared our personal journey with these films, and like I said during the very first Gotta Review Em All episode, these movies need to be reviewed by fans. And sometimes, fans just like what fans like. Oh yeah, remember that narrator at the beginning of the movie? And that is why you must be especially careful for what you wish, because you just might get it. Yeah, no one makes any magical wishes in this movie! Ooh, they're stuck in a dark place nice. with impending doom and no way out. Hey. That sounds like my life. This is my patron shout-out for Jordan Mathis and Steve Sharp. Check out Steve Sharp's music at his YouTube channel, Sharp Rain, because he's freaking awesome. Check out patreon.com in the description below to learn to be a patron today. Later!